In recent memory, there's been one name that's dominated the North American wrestling scene, and that's McMahon. Still, over the last couple of years there has been another who has sought to challenge their monopoly, proving that the industry can indeed have more than one royal family, and that's the Rhodes. The very same family who took on WWE in the 80s and who, up until very recently, represented their chief competition in the current day. So, how did they get to this point? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into their entire storied history in The Rhodes, Wrestling's Greatest Families Episode 2. Unlike most dynasties, this one begins with a plumber. That was the job that Virgil Runnels Sr. had when he met Catherine Treffel back in the 1940s, and obviously, the two shared a strong connection then as, come the middle of that decade, they'd not only be married, but they'd have given birth to their first son, Virgil Riley Runnels Jr., born on October 11, 1945. And as the son of a plumber, Virgil Jr. would gain an appreciation for the simple things in life while growing up in Austin, Texas, with him spending his teenage years attending Johnson High School and getting heavily involved in sports such as baseball and football. In fact, Virgil would prove to be so good at the latter sport that he would even turn pro for a while, briefly getting a chance to try out for the American Football League's Boston Patriots, all before playing for the Continental Football League's Hartford Charter Oaks too. Come 1965, however, the team would have folded, and with the youngster having just gotten married to his sweetheart Sandra around this time, it meant he was going to have to find a new direction for himself if he wanted to earn a living. And that new direction would end up coming two years later as it happened, because it was then that the newlywed saw an advertisement in a local newspaper for a Boston wrestling promotion named Big Time Wrestling that was looking for new recruits. So, taking his wife and driving up to Massachusetts, Virgil would begin his training, learning the ways of the ring from Joe Blanchard and making his debut soon thereafter under the name of Dusty Runnels. But despite showing some early promise, those initial days as a wrestler were tough ones for both him and his wife financially. In fact, with payouts for new recruits being so low at this time, they'd often have to sleep in his car and even get Thanksgiving dinner at a local soup kitchen. And for some men, this would have been the breaking point, but not for Dusty. No, coming from a working class family, he already knew what it was like to go through hard times, and this was something that would gradually endear him to fans as he moved back down to Texas to perform for Fritz Von Erich's World Class Championship Wrestling soon after, there once again changing his ring name, this time to Dusty Rhodes. And this was the final piece of the puzzle as it turned out, because from there, success would begin to come his way in droves, as he quickly became the star of the Southern Territories. But as if this wasn't enough, in his personal life, he and Sandra would also have three children around this time, Kristen, Teal, and Dustin Patrick, the latter of whom would be born on April 11, 1969, and would eventually go on to great success inside the ring too. Before that would happen though, Dusty's rise would continue as, despite not having the traditional wrestler's physique, audiences got behind him more and more, seeing in him something of themselves. And that was how he eventually became known as the American Dream, someone who the working man watching both at home and in the audience would live vicariously through and who would cheer him on in turn as he became a multiple-time NWA World Heavyweight Champion over the next few years. But despite making trips all around the country at this point, his main home would be Jim Crockett Promotions where, by 1985, he was working not only as a wrestler, but as the booker too, writing the show from behind the scenes. For as universally beloved as he was inside the ring though, as a writer, things were more divisive as, with his overuse of the infamous dusty finish and some of his more questionable booking decisions, he acquired plenty of detractors, especially as by this point, JCP was locked into a bitter war with Vince McMahon Jr.'s World Wrestling Federation. Still, he must have done something right, as for many, his promotion was the better of the two, and the one that represented real wrestling with some of its finest moments during this period seeing Dusty continue his rivalry with the nature boy Ric Flair, all while having memorable battles against the likes of Abdullah the Butcher, Terry Funk, and Harley Race. And as a booker, Dusty would also pioneer the wrestling super show too, with him putting on the first Starcade show on November 24th, 1983, beating WrestleMania to the punch by a full two years. As well as that, by this point, he'd also be welcoming his fourth child into the world, as having married his second wife Michelle seven years prior, he would introduce the world to Cody Garrett Runnels on June 30th, 1985. 
And, in an additional trivia note, Cody would also be welcomed into the world by two other wrestling relatives, as his father's by then brothers-in-law Jerry Sags and Fred Ottman would become Cody's uncles. But while Cody was taking up all his family's attention, elsewhere, Dustin would be starting his own journey as a professional wrestler as, after graduating high school in 1988, he would begin his training, taking on his father's gimmick name and working under the moniker of Dustin Rhodes. And quickly finding himself to be a prodigy, perhaps even more so than his dad, Dustin would find quick success in both championship wrestling from Florida and world championship wrestling, the latter being the very company that JCP had morphed into by that point. But this early run in WCW would ultimately be cut short as, when his father was fired in 1989 after bleeding on screen, something which was considered a big no-no for Turner Broadcasting at the time, Dustin would leave too, with him from there trying his luck out in Japan for a while, wrestling for All Japan Pro Wrestling for a period before returning home to the United States in 1990. And when he did return, he would join his father in WWE. Yes, after leaving WCW, Dusty had signed up with the enemy. There though, he would not have the same level of power and influence, something Vince McMahon was quick to make clear as he immediately put him into a polka dot outfit and paired him up with a first time performer, Sapphire. And yes, many would see this as a sign of the boss trying to humble his former competitor, but Dusty was so talented that he was able to make something of it anyway, somehow getting the gimmick over as he feuded with the likes of Macho Man Randy Savage and the million dollar man Ted DiBiase. By 1991, however, this run would be finished too, and both father and son would leave the company and head back down south, where Dusty would once again act as a booker for WCW, albeit this time as part of a committee. But while he was working hard behind the scenes, Dustin would continue to make a name for himself as an in-ring performer, with him picking up the moniker The Natural around this time on account of his effortlessly smooth skills inside of the ring. In fact, during this period, The Rhodes' son would become a tag team champion with both Ricky Steamboat and Barry Windham, all while in singles action, he would capture the United States heavyweight title on two separate occasions. More importantly than this though, he would meet his future wife Terry around this time, someone who was performing as a manager by the name of Alexandra York. Come 1993 then, the two would finally tie the knot, with this proving to be a tumultuous marriage that would give the couple one daughter named Dakota, but which would consistently be marred by Dustin's substance abuse issues. Yes, by this point, the oldest Rhodes son had been struggling with addiction for some time, something which he partially blamed on the poor relationship he had with his dad growing up. Yes, with Dusty always having been on the road and then leaving both him and his mother when he was still just a kid so as to go and start a new family, it left a lot of wounds behind that would take a long time to heal. And these issues would eventually contribute towards Dustin being fired in 1995, although the final straw would actually come when he was caught blading during the infamous King of the Road match at that May's uncensored pay-per-view. Luckily for him though, his most famous role would come soon after this, as he'd be hired by WWE again to play the role of Gold Dust, an androgynous character who broke such new ground that many to this day still consider it to represent the first sparks of the Attitude Era. Of course, some saw this as Vince McMahon taking yet another shot at the Rhodes family by trying to embarrass the family, but whether this was true or not, Dustin took what he was given and made something iconic of it, turning Goldust into one of the most over characters on the roster, as while portraying him as a heel, he would play up to the gay panic of the time by getting in his opponent's heads with his sexually suggestive antics. And eventually his real life wife Terry would be added to the package too as they both grew in popularity to the point that the company had to turn them babyface. Soon after this though, the more reality based era the company was moving in would see Dustin's relationship to his father be acknowledged on screen for the first time as, with his real life substance abuse issues continuing to worsen, Dustin began to lose control of his life, splitting from Terry both on screen and in reality, then following this up by morphing into the artist formerly known as Gold Dust. And this would see him turn heel again as he picked up a new partner in Luna Vachon, with things only getting weirder and weirder from there as he began coming out mimicking various different people every week, with some of the most memorable of these being Sable Dust, Marilyn Manson Dust, and Dusty Dust. Yes, it felt very much like a visual representation of how fractured his mind was at the time, and in hindsight, probably not what he needed. 
No, what he really needed was help in getting himself sober, something his father would not be able to provide as by then the two had become estranged and hadn't spoken in years. And this was used for further material on screen when, in June of 1998, Dustin would come out on TV to cut a work shoot promo where he burned the gold dust suit and began claiming that he was born again and would have nothing to do with his family's wrestling legacy going forward, even going as far as to go by Dustin Runnels for a while. And this would all reach ahead when, a year later, he would be released from WWE after having been unable to get his personal demons under control, with him from there moving back over to WCW and taking on a bizarre, albeit brief, character named Seven that was quickly dropped. After that though, with both him and his father now under the same roof again, the two would begin to repair their relationship as Dustin milled around in the undercard, wrestling as the American Nightmare for a time. Of course, all that would change again, however, when in March of 2001, WCW would go under, being bought out by Vince McMahon himself from there, as the Rhodes were once more forced to look elsewhere for work. For Dusty then, this would see him do spells in the upstart promotion Total Nonstop Action Wrestling, all well after moving around the indies for a year or so, his son would find himself working for WWE under the Gold Dust moniker again there having something of a career revival as he had a memorable tag team run with Booker T. Sadly though, his drug and alcohol issues would continue to be a thorn in his side as, by 2003, he would once again be fired, with him doing brief runs in Japan, the US Indies, and TNA afterwards, where he would introduce the world to a new character named Black Rain, someone who was supposed to represent the ultimate evil of his psyche, but in reality just ended up being an out of shape Dustin struggling to perform at his highest level. But things weren't all bad for the Rhodes family at this time as, while Dustin might have been reaching new lows, his half-brother Cody was starting his career in the ring, with him having graduated high school with an impressive amateur record not long before this. And that was how, after his father had returned to WWE in 2005 to work as a backstage producer, Cody would get signed up to a developmental contract the following year. From there, making his way to Ohio Valley Wrestling, where he would learn the in-house style. And it also helped that, perhaps learning from his past mistakes, his father would be by his son's side every step of the way, helping him to progress quickly as by 2007 he would be ready to make his main roster debut. So with his dad guiding him behind the scenes then, the youngest Rhodes child would find early success when he became a tag team champion with both Hardcore Holly and Ted DiBiase Jr. at various points. And as well as this, he would also form a stable with DiBiase and Randy Orton called The Legacy that saw him get the chance to feud with the likes of D-Generation X and the McMahon family for a while. And this seemed to be an omen of good things for the entire Rhodes clan as, around this same time, not only would Dusty get inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame and even get the chance to have one final pay-per-view match against Randy Orton, but Dustin would finally get his life on track again too, something which saw him make his return to WWE in 2008 as he once again put on the makeup and became Gold Dust. Despite his years of abuse he'd inflicted upon his body though, the older of the two brothers was arguably even better upon this comeback, with him appearing to have aged like a fine wine as he proved to be one of the most underrated wrestlers on the roster at any given time. So, not to be outdone, Cody would change up his gimmick around this point too, working on his character more here as he became dashing Cody Rhodes, and then later, after suffering a broken nose during a match, undashing Cody Rhodes, a phantom of the opera-esque villain who came down to the ring decked out in a face mask. And this would ultimately see the youngest of the family become Intercontinental Champion for the first time in August of 2011, a belt he would wear with pride, as while this was happening, his father was taking up a role as head writer of NXT, a position which allowed him to build the next generation of stars such as Roman Reigns, Charlotte Flair, Bray Wyatt, Kevin Owens, Sasha Banks, and countless others. But that wasn't to say he would never appear on the main roster again because, when Cody and Dustin finally teamed together to take on the authority in 2013, their father would be by their side as they ended up pulling off one of the greatest feel-good moments of the modern era when they beat The Shield at that October's Battleground pay-per-view. After that, Cody would change things up once more when he morphed into Stardust, a comic book-like supervillain. However, this was not the most popular with fans and his new attitude ended up leading to the two siblings feuding with each other by the start of 2014, something they both hoped was going to climax in a big singles match at WrestleMania 32. 
In the end though, not believing the match was big enough for the showcase of the Immortals, Vince McMahon would choose to blow the whole thing off a month earlier at Fastlane instead. And so, after realizing he was never going to be valued as highly as he thought he should be then, Cody would begin to think about leaving WWE altogether, with this decision ending up being solidified when, on June 10, 2015, Dusty Rhodes would sadly die of kidney failure. So, wanting to honor his father, Cody decided to bet on himself and request his release from the company the following year, something he was ultimately granted as from there, both he and his wife, former backstage interviewer Brandy, would move over to the indies as they set out to prove they could be so much more. While they were doing this though, Dustin continued to work for WWE, playing more of an undercard role as he worked as part of a comedy tag team with R-Truth for a while. Meanwhile, over in the likes of TNA, New Japan Pro Wrestling, Ring of Honor, and Pro Wrestling Guerrilla, Cody was reinventing himself, now billing himself as the American Nightmare 2, and showing that he had it in him to be a star on his own merits, as he quickly became one of the top indie names out there. And this was further bolstered when he not only became the ROH World Champion in 2017, but also the newest member of the Bullet Club, the hottest stable in all of wrestling at the time, and one which had already been able to rocket the likes of Kenny Omega, the Young Bucks, Prince Devitt, and AJ Styles to superstardom. So with this new team behind them, Cody's success only continued as he quickly became behind the scenes friends with Omega and the Bucks, who had by then splintered off to form their own stable within the stable, named The Elite. And the success they were all able to have outside of the WWE machine eventually led some to wonder if they couldn't put on a big show of their own in North America, with this feeling ultimately being crystallized when, in May of that same year, Cody and Dave Meltzer would place a Twitter bet where the former claimed he and the rest of the elite would be able to draw 10,000 fans for an arena show. Of course, it was a big ask, but in the end, the elite were successful in doing this, as in May of 2018, they would host All In, the biggest independent wrestling show held inside North America in decades, with just over 11,000 fans in attendance. But it wasn't just pulling this feat off that made the night such a special one for the youngest Rhodes child, as it would also be the night where he defeated Nick Aldis to become the first ever second generation NWA World Heavyweight Champion something which served as vindication for anyone who had ever said he wasn't good enough. Still, for as great of a moment as this was, it would really only represent the start of the story, as following this, owner of Fulham FC and the Jacksonville Jaguars Tony Khan, himself a lifelong wrestling fan, would begin discussing the ins and outs of starting a new promotion with the Elite. And this would eventually lead to a press conference being held on January 1, 2019, where it was announced that Cody, along with Omega, The Bucks, Hangman Page, and Chris Jericho, would become founding members of All Elite Wrestling, with Cody, Omega, and The Bucks in particular acting as executive vice presidents to the company. From there, the youngest Rhodes child would do just what his father had years prior by battling it out with WWE taking their weekly show Dynamite and thoroughly defeating NXT in the subsequent ratings war. And while he was doing this, he was also finding time to put on some of the best matches of the modern era against the likes of Darby Allin, Brody Lee, and his big brother Dustin. Yes, also feeling undervalued by Vince McMahon, Dustin had chosen to make the jump over to AEW after it had formed two, with him from there taking on a player-coach role as he set about training the next generation. And that was how it looked like it was going to continue on then, as with AEW growing to the point of even occasionally beating Raw in the ratings, it looked like it would be the Rhodes vs the McMahons for the foreseeable future. That was until February of 2022, however, as it was then that, in a move that shocked the wrestling industry, Cody and his wife Brandy announced their departure from AEW. And while the reasons for this still remain unclear, it appears a combination of both losing his early booking power with the company and seeing his pay scale drop when compared to the likes of CM Punk and Brian Danielson led to him deciding to leave. Sure, it also didn't help that by that point, many fans had turned on him after some pretty hit and miss programs in the year leading up to this, but that still didn't change the fact that by then, he'd done what few thought was even possible anymore in helping to create real competition for WWE again. And while Dustin continues to remain with AEW going forward, it's now assumed that Cody will be making his way back to WWE imminently, something which we'll have to wait and see play out before we make a judgement on as, while it's unlikely he'll have the same level of creative freedom there, he'll surely be treated like a big star, at least at first given his status as a founding father of the competition. 
Will it all work out in his favor? Was it the right decision in the end? How will this affect the overall wrestling war? Who knows? But as long as there's no polka dot ring gear this time, we're pretty sure the Rhodes legacy will remain secure as one of the most important families in the industry's history because with three bona fide legends among the ranks, they're absolutely undeniable at this point. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.